Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is David Andelfato. David is the vice president of the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank and has published widely in the field of monetary economics. David also blogs at Macromania and can be found on Twitter providing interesting commentary. David recently published two posts on inflation and unemployment that has stirred up interest in the Phillips curve and its implication for inflation. Today, he joins us to discuss the Phillips curve and help us better understand the debate surrounding it. David, welcome back to the show. Oh, hi, David. Thanks for having me. Uh, before beginning, I'm going to have to give a disclaimer. I sure. would like would like everybody to know that the, the views that are put forth here, the opinions that I express are exclusively my own and in, uh, should be in no way or, or not necessarily the views shared by uh, my colleagues here at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis or anywhere in the Federal Reserve System. You stirred up something of a hornet's nest. Of course, this hornet's nest was already stirring. And, and I want to begin by giving the backstory behind this discussion that we've had on Twitter and the blogosphere and the Federal Reserve officials have been having themselves. And this is the inflation mystery. So the Fed's uh, inflation target, it targets PCE inflation officially. And it also looks at core PCE inflation, which removes energy and, and food, which is more volatile. The headline PCE inflation rate since the recovery, and I'm dating this uh, right after June 2009 when the economy turns around, it has averaged 1.4 percent. That's the headline PCE rate. And then the core PCE inflation's averaged 1.5 percent. So the Fed's targeting 2 percent, and it is persistently hitting below that. Um, the average is below that, and it's become a puzzle, a mystery. And just to be clear to our listeners, I think most of them know this, the Fed's inflation target was officially adopted in 2012, but even before then it was kind of unofficially, kind of implicitly following something close to 2%. And this has been interesting to watch because there's been numerous articles written and speeches given and debates had over why inflation has persistently undershot um, its target. I, I just want to run through a few articles with their titles just to give you a flavor. And interestingly, David, as I was looking this up, I found articles as far back as late 2014. In fact, the Wall Street Journal had an article in November 2014 titled, Fed Faces an Inflation Conundrum. And then as we move forward, uh, here's a New York Times article from early 2015 with the title, Omens of the Fed's Struggle with Prices. Lovely title. Uh, central bankers grapple with inflation puzzle from the Financial Times later in 2015. Um, <clears throat> other many, many other similar titles to that. The Fed's inflation puzzle, Wall Street Journal in 2017. Um, real recently, Bloomberg Business Week had an article, The Great Inflation Mystery. So if you look out and you, you look at what's happening to inflation, there's a mystery, a puzzle, a conundrum that's occurring. And the stated reason is because of Phillips curve. So can you help us understand why the Phillips curve is creating so much bewilderment about the inflation rate? Yeah, sure. I I think it's uh, basically because, you know, according to a more or less conventional way of thinking about things, there exists a a so-called natural rate of unemployment. Um, and a Phillips curve relationship, which is a, a negative relationship between either wage or price inflation and uh, the rate of unemployment. And the idea is that, uh, you know, to the extent that um, aggregate demand is, is bumping the economy around and aggregate demand manifests itself as higher or lower rates of unemployment, that uh, in a period when unemployment rate is low, that uh, aggregate demand is supposed to be high um, and the unemployment rate is below its so-called natural rate, that this will ultimately manifest itself as some sort of a competition in the labor market, leading firms to bid up nominal wages, 
passing along the cost onto consumers so that one could uh, one can expect uh, in in times of low unemployment to sooner or later manifest itself as as a rise a persistent rise in in the price level and and conversely in in times of uh, depression uh the fact that this this doesn't seem to be happening is um uh is not necessarily something that's inconsistent with the phillips curve theory because the Phillips curve theory does does have a a, a free parameter in in that the the natural rate of unemployment is not something that is directly observable, and so that um, in order to understand uh, why, for example, in the period of time you alluded to since the crisis, why inflation has been so low, one could in principle appeal to the the notion that what has been happening is that the natural rate of unemployment itself has been falling over time. Um, and that's basically, you know, gotten people along so far, but with the unemployment rate now down to about 4.1%, very, very low by historical standards, um, pe- many people are, are just, uh, they're, they're refusing to believe, I guess, in their own minds that the natural rate of unemployment could be any much lower, uh, and that therefore the, the missing inflation is a bit of a conundrum. Yes, and many Fed officials themselves were warning about crossing that natural rate threshold several years back. They were convinced that um, you know, we we're going to have high inflation if we start if we don't start raising interest rates. We're going to have higher inflation because unemployment had reached a point where uh, it would start to generate inflation through the Phillips curve. So the Phillips curve saying. We've exhausted all the slack. We've got to have price pressures, price pressures emerging, and it hasn't happened. Now, you mentioned one explanation. One, one way around that is to simply argue the natural rate of unemployment has fallen and will continue to fall. Um, some also argue about a Phillips curve being flatter. Is that right? That's right. And what uh, does that mean? Oh, that's. Um, I guess that's in reference to. Uh you know, if you take a look at, uh, at the rate of, uh, inflation over, say, as you say, during the, uh, the end of the, the last recession, you know, it's been undershooting. It's about 1.5% or, you know, maybe up to 2% sometimes. But the rate of inflation hasn't varied very much over the last decade, let's say. And yet the unemployment rate has fallen from a peak of, you know, 10%, uh, during the peak of the crisis down to 4.1% today. So to say that the Phillips curve appears to have flattened is simply a statement saying that the, the relationship, the cyclical, the, I hesitate to say cyclical, but the, the, the co-movement between unemployment and inflation seems to be absent. Yes. Yeah, so there's a breakdown in the relationship as one argument, uh, one justification for why inflation hasn't taken off. You mentioned, again, that the natural rate falling. Joe mm-hmm. Gagnon from the Peterson Institute for International Economics, he had a, a little piece he wrote up where he wrote, there is no inflation puzzle. And his argument is, look, when you get close to zero percent inflation, when inflation gets really, really low, people are reluctant to, cr- to cut prices and wages, and therefore the Phillips curve gets flatter. And we would expect to see what we're seeing. And he argues maybe after 3% inflation or so, you'll see the Phillips curve you know, kick in. It won't be so flat anymore. So one explanation is the Phillips curve is flatter. But again, this kind of begs the question, why is it getting flatter? And it, it appears to be getting flatter and flatter. And some say it's disappeared altogether. So you could throw out the natural rate declining as an explanation. You could say the Phillips curve is getting flatter as an explanation. I saw another recent explanation given. Uh, by Nick Bunker at Equitable Growth, a think tank, and he argued that there's less bargaining power now with labor in- labor share of income going down, and that uh, as labor share of income declines, there's less bargaining power, and we see less you know wage and price pressure. Just another form again of, of the Phillips curve argument. Are there any other stories that we know about that? People who believe in the Phillips curve um, would say explain it other than the ones we've discussed. I'm not familiar with uh, any other okay. argument. Um, the one that Nick Bunker, Bunker promotes, and you know, many people have I've heard similar things like that. I, I would throw out a challenge to them um, that uh, you know a change in bargaining power. 
uh, at least theoretically, should manifest itself over long periods of time as changes in the real wage, not in nominal wage, not in a persistent change in the nominal wage. So I'm kind of skeptical about these stories that rely on, on, on real wages that should affect real wages of how they ultimately manifest themselves as persistent changes in the rate of growth of the price level. Okay. So the Phillips curve story is being strained, to say the least. And even its most fiercest advocates, you know, they, they've been given pause given this incredible journey to low unemployment and still really, really low inflation. And again, I just want to stress that there have been many people, you know, many observers, including Fed officials, telling us several years ago that we were going to have high inflation because we've reached a point in the Phillips curve where the slack's been exhausted and inflation's going to take off. And that was a justification for raising interest rates starting in 2015 and, and afterwards. And yet there hasn't been this, this increase in inflation. So there's been a puzzle. One could even argue that based on that reasoning, maybe the Fed raised rates too quickly. But let's step back and get away from, from discussing Fed policy and, and focus more on this mystery. You have jumped into the conversation and presented an alternative view one that looks more at money supply, money demand relationships. So tell us what do you think is going on behind the low inflation? Yeah, um, I want to say that, uh, first of all, in terms of the puzzle relating to the conventional Phillips curve view, I mean, it really depends on your perspective of what's so puzzling um, out there. Um, mm -hmm. The puzzle really relates to those people who wish to adopt that view and assert that the natural rate of unemployment is say 4.5% or something like that. Um, if one is willing to let go of this notion of a, a relatively fixed or this lower bound, if you like, on the natural rate of unemployment, the puzzle disappears. I mean, one can just simply uh, make reference to the notion that the natural rate tends to vary over time. So it's not a puzzle from that perspective. Uh, in terms of kind of an alternative way of thinking about inflation dynamics. I mean, I've, I've been a proponent of, um, as many others have, it's not unique to me, of course, but this notion that, you know, another uh, possibly complementary way of, of viewing the inflation, the phenomenon of inflation is to view it through the lens of a more traditional money supply, money demand, fiscal policy sort of uh, uh, view. And by, uh, by money supply and demand, I, I mean not, not in the context of narrow, narrowly defined monetary aggregates, but in the context of a theory that, uh, understands or, and respects the fact that, in, especially in, in recent times, that the U.S. Treasury is, is a de facto kind of source of, uh, monetary, uh, object, if you like. It's, it's a very close substitute to central bank reserves. And as such, we live in a world where the, the issuance of U.S. treasuries is, is, is virtually a form of, of monetary policy. I mean, that's one point to point out. Uh, and the, the second point I'd like to stress is that, that this theory does not just, uh, you know, the, the, this theory identifies, um, the importance not only of, of money supply, um, but also money demand. And again, I mean broadly the demand for, for safe assets like U.S. treasuries, U.S. dollars. So there, you know, there's, this is nothing kind of revolutionary. This is just bringing supply and demand analysis to, uh, to monetary objects and using kind of more or less conventional monetarist ideas to think about uh, the forces that are generating inflation. Okay, so you're telling a story where the money supply relative to money demand is driving the relatively low inflation. And some have argued, look, sure. what's what's one and a half percent? We're getting worked up over one and a half percent. But <laughs> sure. but I, I do think it's important for the Fed's credibility to hit its target. If they persistently undershoot, then something's not working, especially well, since it's been right. so many years. But I mean, on the other hand, um, so let's 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 follow through with uh, the way that I'm thinking about this. So, you know, there's uh, the U.S. Treasury is a very very close substitute to uh, U.S. dollars. Okay, let's take that as a premise. Okay. So anything that affects the demand for U.S. Treasuries, by virtue of the fact that it's a close substitute to the U.S. dollar, is going to affect the aggregate demand for real money balances, broadly defined. 
an increase in money demand, you know, for a fixed interest rate, uh, like remember the Fed was pegging at 25 basis points, an increase in money demand will ultimately manifest itself as disinflationary pressure. I mean, this is my interpretation, for example, of why, you know, when the Chinese increase their demand for U.S. treasuries, they're willing to cut their the price of the exports that they send us in order to acquire these monetary objects. This could in part uh, account for the low uh, inflation rate for imports, for example. Um, so... You know, if we think about it through this lens, um, the, you know, there were a lot of forces that kind of increased the demand for, for, for monetary objects like U.S. dollars and U.S. treasuries in the crisis and just, you know, in the years following the crisis. We had, uh, we had, of course, the flight to safety because of the crisis. We had the, the crisis in Europe. Um, we, we had, uh, since then, uh, an enhanced demand for these, uh, monetary objects through the regulatory reforms, uh, Dodd-Frank reforms, Basel III reforms. So we've seen a, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of indirect evidence, at least, that there's been an enhanced growth in the demand for these monetary objects. At the same time, uh, even though the supply of U.S. Treasuries uh, rose very rapidly during the crisis, I mean, the rate of growth of nominal debt has, has, has decelerated considerably, uh, and uh, at least up until recently. And, you know, we not too long ago, we were talking about, you know, debt ceilings and things like this. And, uh, yep. you know, the, the, the idea is, you know, there's, there's still this enhanced worldwide demand for U.S. money and U.S. treasuries and, and the supply of it, uh, didn't seem like it was forthcoming. And, and I, I argue that all of these factors, uh, conspired to, uh, or could possibly conspire to, to, to be disinflationary. And this is, this is a statement that's largely, you know, independent of, what the unemployment rate is doing, although, you know, the, uh, you, one could layer a Phillips curve argument on on top of this as well. And so, um, you know, this is one interpretation I offer as to one reason why inflation uh, could have been so low for so long, and that um, and that barring kind of some 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 turnaround in in the rate of growth of the demand for these objects, uh, we could expect this low inflation going forward. And of course, what's happened recently is, is I think that we've, we've witnessed this kind of little bit of a turnaround. We've seen some evidence of it. We've seen some, uh, evidence of, uh, a, a significant change in fiscal, fiscal policy that's, you know, projected to increase the, the rate of growth of the supply of these objects. And we've also seen considerable evidence of a, a of a decline in the foreign demand for, for these objects. So, so these these are forces that uh, pose uh, inflation risks through the lens of the of the theory. And again, it's it's nothing. It's nothing. I don't have to rely on the natural rate of unemployment to understand how the forces of supply and demand for for broadly defined money manifest themselves as as inflation. So maybe one of the challenges for fans of Phillips curve thinking is is to embrace this idea. That money is more than just your standard M2 aggregate or M1 yes. aggregate. And, and maybe if they were to you know, think hard and, and appreciate the point that you're making, that if you look at all money assets, which include treasuries, treasuries effectively serve as money for institutional investors. Um, and if you look at that relative to the demand for them, uh, there is this shortfall. And I, th I think that's part of the story we have to tell. I'm very sympathetic to this. I think listeners of the show will know. That uh, there's both retail money assets, which you and I would use, and small businesses, and then there's institutional money assets. And the run on the shadow banking system was a run on, you know, those institutional money assets, and it did collapse. Um, uh, there's a the Vizia M4 measure, which kind of gets at this, and it shows a collapse in 2008. Mm -hmm. And even though it's recovered, it's still below the trend path it was before, and relative to demand, it clearly is is below. But I, I want to maybe flesh this out a little bit more. So you're telling a story that we need to embrace a broader view of money. I totally get that and I, I endorse that too. I think it's a it's an important idea because the government's liabilities, which create you know this inflationary pressures, are both the monetary base and treasury liabilities. Now I want to I want to kind of maybe expand it even beyond that in the following ways. I think part of the part of the, the influence on the low inflation might also be the velocity of, of these of these monetary liabilities, and that in turn might be influenced by the, the future 
you know, fiscal condition of our government. In other words, if the market expects, if the bond market expects that there's going to be more debt monetization in the future, that should in- influence the velocity today, right? So the oh, health. I think that's critical. Okay. Critical. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it, as, as the, uh, you're probably familiar, more familiar than most, uh, but you know, you go to, um, the fiscal theory, the price level, you know, those, those are those papers that stress the fiscal side, um, uh, of how it interacts with monetary policy. I mean, all of these, uh, the theory is very, the theory at least is very, very clear that the, the way that monetary policy interacts with fiscal policy is absolutely critical for, for, uh, generating inflation or, or what people expect about inflation. Okay. So just to summarize, there's both kind of a short run component or a contemporaneous component, which is the supply of treasuries and monetary base today. But then there's also this forward looking part of what you're, you're saying is that in the future, will the government be running enough surpluses to pay off its debt? And if that's not the case, if there's going to be some, some debts that it doesn't pay off, eventually it has to monetize it. Then people today want to unload some of those securities, some of those, some of that money, and that increases velocity. So there's both kind of a, maybe a shortfall relative to today's demand, but there's also some pressures from forward looking, you know, bond market players. Which one do you think is more important? The, 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 the outlook for the future health of, of the government's finances or just the, the current supply today? That's a good question. And I think that is a question that ultimately has to be answered, um, empirically. I mean, I, I, I go take a look uh, at the inflation nominal debt dynamic uh, in many countries around the world. And it definitely does seem like, uh, there that there's a bit of both elements at work. Um, you know, the, the idea that, um, you know, uh, that the fiscal authority might be planning to monetize future debts isn't critical. I mean, the fact that the, uh, the fiscal authority does actually monetize, uh, <laughs> its debts, uh, contemporaneously will obviously, I think, you know, even Phillips curve guys will understand it's just kind of aggregate demand. Yep. Uh, too many, too much, a lot of money chasing fewer goods is going to cause the contemporaneous price level to rise independent of what people are, are thinking about in the future. Um, to the extent that people do are forward looking and, and do have some expectation about how far the fiscal authority is going to take things, I think will, will only serve to, to exacerbate these, these forces. But I don't think it's kind of critical. Okay. So just to recap, there's a demand for money that's broader than just kind of the standard M1, M2 monetary base that maybe you learned in your principles of macroeconomics class. There's a broad measure of money. Um, there's an elevated demand for it, and that's evidenced by the relatively low interest rates. Even now, you know, 10-year treasury yields are, what, 2.9% or so, which is still really low compared to historical. Before the crisis, they're above 5%. Uh, so there's still this elevated demand, and that demand for our debt really um, – suggests that there's a shortfall of money. And this is probably one of the hardest parts to communicate or to, to share with folks who maybe don't think this way. And, and that is, you know, the world is basically asking the U.S. government to produce more debt, even though maybe we don't need it domestically. Internationally, the world's knocking at the door of the Treasury. Please, please give us more debt. Is that right? right. <laughs> that's that's basically it. Um that's uh, part of the great privilege of uh, of the U.S. has in, in supplying the world with the reserve currency and the reserve asset, yes. But that's a tough point to make, and I, I could never imagine a politician running on that, saying, look, I want to create more safe assets for the world, which means more debt for us. <laughs> um, I don't think you'd get very far in an election if you did that. Cause it seems- no, but it is, it is just a simple extension of even if you think in a closed economy, mm-hmm. right, with the government having net debt outstanding that it needs never repay, and this net debt circulates within the economy as an exchange medium. I mean, the principle is exactly the same there. I mean, the government need not yep. ever repay that debt that circulates and serves a very valuable role in financial markets. It lubricates financial markets. It's a source of collateral in a variety of markets and credit derivatives and repo. And um, and so now we extend this to uh, foreigners. 
I mean, the principle's the same, except now foreigners are exporting their goods and services to us um, in exchange for our paper. Uh, and this manifests itself as trade imbalances for the United States. But uh, in a sense, we're exporting our, our paper to them that they find useful for some reason, and, and we get goods and services. Yeah, I like to tell folks that President Trump is missing an important area where we have already won the trade war, and that's in right. exporting debt. We are doing a knockout job <laughs> exporting <laughs> safe assets to the rest of the world. That's our comparative advantage. We are winning this. And, you know, if he could just shift his focus onto that and be less worried about other trade areas might be a better place. Um, but this is a good point because I recently had Danielle Gabor on the show. She's in England, but she's doing work on safe assets in Europe. One of the big discussions over there is can they create a truly European safe asset? And there's talk of a European safe bond or SBs where they would have basically a securitized bond with government debt, you know, behind it. And it's not clear that would work very well, but they're talking about this because there is this shortage. They recognize this, this point that you made that there's an appetite for truly safe assets. And right now the safest bet on the planet is the U S government. That's right. Okay. Well, let's, let's take this understanding and move it back into the Phillips curve discussion. So what you're, you're articulating is that there's, Basically, an excess money demand problem that there's there's more demand for monetary assets than is currently being supplied. And that may explain the relatively low inflation. And that may be an easier um, story to tell relative to the Phillips curve. People are straining over backwards to explain why we have low inflation with the Phillips curve. And what you are articulating, I think, is, look, it's a lot easier story to tell folks if you just tell this story. Is that right? I think that's one way to to view it. In fact, and, and 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 remember, I don't necessarily think these two views are mutually exclusive. I mean, they both emphasize kind of different parts of the economic uh, forces that are at work here. One reason why I I wanted to promote this alternative perspective was because I was worried that uh, U.S. policymakers, um, by focusing too much on kind of conventional uh, Phillips curves notions would fall, uh, uh, would potentially fall into the trap of, of being too aggressive in their interest rate hikes because, you know, if one is wedded to the idea that the natural rate is high and, and we can see the unemployment rate falling, and if one is wedded to the idea that this just has to, has to manifest itself as future inflation, then one is going to want to act preemptively. And, and I, I think that you know, one can very clearly see uh, this type of thinking uh, among people at the FOMC. And, and that's perfectly fine, I think, to think that way. But um, I think it's also useful to temper that that uh, interpretation. And one way to temper it, of course, is, is as, as, as Chair Powell mentioned, was the uh, the willingness of the FOMC to be data dependent and, and to consider the possibility that the natural rate itself is falling. Uh, that's one way to temper it. Another way to temper it is is to kind of view the inflation pro- uh, process through the lens of, of the model that I, I just uh, outlined, that you know, if we were to uh, understand that you know, one reason for the uh, surprisingly low inflation is the elevated world demand for safe assets like the U.S. dollar and the U.S. Treasury, that this might, um, you know, permit us to understand where some of this this disinflationary pressure is coming from, and we are, we we might be less inclined then on those that ground to to raise our interest rate policy too aggressively. Yeah. It's been interesting to watch the FOMC wrestle with this issue. I know your boss, for example, um, comes at it from a different perspective. He doesn't embrace the Phillips curve, if I understand him correctly, whereas most of the FOMC does. But as you mentioned, they've, they've, I don't know, they've measured their belief in it. Some view it as flatter. Some are still, you know, puzzled, scratching their chins, trying to figure out what's going on. It will be interesting to see moving forward if this, if this incident, you know, this this period of low inflation and seemingly tight labor markets leads to a deeper, you know, reconsideration of the mechanism behind you know inflation. Um, right now, though, all I guess all I see, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. All I see is just you know trying to 
make the Phillips curve work better. You know, adjust the parameters, flatten it, lower the natural unemployment rate. <laughs> but do you get a sense there'll be some kind of deep soul searching from this experience? Um, I, I should hope so. I think that, um, you know, the, my experience has been that uh, people serving on the FOMC are, are very open minded to, to, to different views. I mean, it's not like we, you know, they, they like us, we don't change our, our religion overnight. Right. We, 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 we have to be persuaded um, as the evidence kind of weighs in a, against us. And like I said, uh, this doesn't necessarily uh, require a, a lot of whole lot of soul searching, but perhaps a little less. Less reliance on on one particular way of interpreting the data. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, we'll see. I mean, I can't say for sure, but my experience suggests that um, perhaps so. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> okay, very nice. Well, David, that's a great optimistic take. There's some folks though who still seem fairly wetted, or at least misinterpret what you meant in your. Um, conversation on this topic. And I'm going to turn to one person in particular, one very prominent person, and that's Paul Krugman. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, accused you of, quote, immaculate inflation, unquote. So this term immaculate inflation. And let me read to you and our listeners just a, a brief excerpt from his piece where he replied to you. He said, I see that David Andelfato is at it again, asserting that there's something weird about asserting an unemployment inflation link and that inflation is driven by an imbalance between money supply and money demand. Look, economics is about what people do. Whatever you think is the ultimate cause of an economic phenomenon, your story about how that phenomenon happens has to include an explanation of how people's incentives change. Even if you think that inflation is fundamentally a monetary phenomenon, wage and price centers don't care about money demand. They care about their own ability or lack thereof to charge more, which has to, has to involve the amount of slack in the economy. Okay. That's Paul Krugman's, um, response to you. And it sounds like to me that he's concerned about the actual maybe mechanics. So what is your response to him? I know you actually had a follow up post, but how do you reply to that? Yeah. I mean, my, I think that um, in my follow-up post, I, I remarked that I found very little to disagree with um, in terms of what he mm -hmm. he was saying. I I think um, I think maybe he misinterpreted uh, some of the things I was saying, um, and I, I went to some length in a follow-up post to see where we might uh, bridge our gaps in understanding. Um, you know, he says that I was asserting that there's something weird about asserting an unemployment inflation link. I don't recall asserting anything <laughs> weird about it. Um, I, in fact, I went out of my way to point out that one can clearly see in recessionary episodes, at least those episodes not driven by oil price shocks, that there's a clear negative relationship between inflation and unemployment. That what I was really talking about was uh, the non the non recessionary events, the, the kind of longer term during the recovery phase. I remarked that very often inflation and unemployment seem to move in the same direction for many years in a row, and that uh, so I was really uh, maybe there's a part of, uh, a bit of confusion here, uh, you know, possibly my fault for not being clear that uh, I wasn't talking about. Uh, um, you know, asserting that there was no no link between inflation and unemployment. Um, he's on his in terms of, uh, I guess his his other broader point. Um, you know about your, a story having to you know explain what incentives are, are 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 being changed for people to act in different ways. I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And I think that, uh, you know, I've been guilty of not being clear enough. A, a, a lot of economists are. We have to remind ourselves constantly the way Paul does that. We have to be clear about what incentives, what incentivizes people to, to change their behavior. Um, let's see. He says, what did he say that? Uh, well, he if, says, if you think that inflation is fundamentally a monetary phenomenon, which you shouldn't, uh, wage and price setters don't care about money demand. They care about their own ability or lack thereof to charge more, which has to do with uh, slack in the economy. I mean, I kind of, I, I, I think it's kind of funny, right? I mean, uh, wage and price setters don't care about 
aggregate money demand. I guess that's true. But whenever a retailer cuts the price for his goods, he's implicitly increasing his demand for money. So, uh, you know, what is it that motivates uh, a, a retailer to cut their price? And, and uh, you know, for me, I interpret that as an increase in money demand. So I, I'm led to believe that maybe uh, some of the disagreement here is just semantic. Um, well, yeah, let, let me uh, push back on Krugman's point because sure. we have this whole field, this whole discipline called finance, <laughs> where a big part of it is about rebalancing portfolios, right? People and firms respond to incentives. People do care about what assets they're holding, what composition of assets they're holding. Um, you know, during a recession, people try to rebalance their portfolios in a very significant way towards the liquid assets, toward money. Um, they're not, you know, mindlessly doing this. They're doing it because they're consciously aware they need liquidity. They, there's uncertainty. Their precautionary demand goes up. Um, and then, you know, at some point, once the recession ends, maybe their demand for, for liquidity gets satiated. They don't need to do that as much. They start to spend again. So I, I do think you can tell a, a incentive microeconomic story from an asset side. People do rebalance portfolios all the time. Your home, your car, your cash, your retirement account. <laughs> It's, and he, even people who may not have all those assets, they're still constantly thinking about money. And, and this is where I think it's important to recognize money is a very different asset and very important. Money is the one asset on, you know, every market. You mess with that one asset, you're going to mess with every market. So I, I do think it's, there's something there. Now, I, I do think to, to maybe come back and try to bridge a gap with what Paul Krugman is saying. I, I do think when people rebalance their portfolios, when money demand, real money demand changes, it will have a, an effect on spending more broadly and therefore on slack. You know, if, if, peop, if people start spending more and, and prices get bid up because of that spending, because they're rebalancing the portfolios. And if there's nominal wage rigidity or output price rigidity, then there can be real effects and vice versa. So I think there is a maybe an identification problem here, but I do think you can tell a reasonable microeconomic incentive driven story through money as well. No, I think you're right. And I, I don't, um, I think actually, uh, I'm not sure if it's so much of an identification problem as much as it's just looking at the two sides of the same coin. That's fair. I mean, he's, he's very, very comfortable in, in thinking about slack and a, a fall in the aggregate demand for goods and services. Well, the other, the other side of the coin of that is just an increase in the demand for money, safety, um, and so, you know, these, these two, uh, these two <laughs> apparently different phenomena are, in fact, just two sides of the same coin. So there's really not, uh, any need to disagree, I don't think, too much on this. And indeed, you know, at the end of the day, I, I might add, because I think this is probably the most important part, at the end of the day, uh, he agrees with my policy conclusions. Hmm. Explain that. Well, he, he says that, uh, he says that the Fed might be, uh, um, when, and he starts out his post, he, he answers three questions. He says, does the Fed know how low the unemployment rate can go? No. Should the Fed be tightening now, even though inflation is still low? Uh, he says, probably not. He thinks that the Fed might be making a mistake. Uh, and he lists a, a several reasons for why that's the case. Um, my own post was motivated by the same, uh, the same, um, problem. I, I gave a kind of a different set of reasons for for why perhaps the Fed could be walking into a mistake. So at the end of the day, I look at his uh, response um, and I go, "Yeah, we both agree uh, on 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 the policy recommendation." So perhaps there's not really uh, too much substantive difference in our views after all. Yeah, that, that's fair. And going back to the two sides of one coin. Uh, George Selgin had this comment I saw. It was on Twitter or maybe on a blog somewhere, but he wrote, unemployment and inflation are both consequences of the same cause, which is declining nominal demand or spending. It is as silly as saying that overflowing gutters are caused by open umbrellas when both, in fact, share a common cause, heavy rain. So, you know, if there is this uncertainty, shock, this fear that causes rebalancing portfolios, you're going to see a change both in inflation and unemployment, you know, usually. Now, with that, with that said, I, I want to point to some episodes where you don't see that happening, not including the, this present period we're discussing. 
But Scott Sumner had an interesting post. He replied to this conversation. You had your post. Um, David Glasner, I believe, had a post. And, of course, there's a lot going on on Twitter. Um, Carol Balmer wrote a piece, I believe, for Market Watch. So there's been an ongoing conversation about this. But Scott Sumner had a really interesting historical episode he pointed to. And the title of his post was FDR's Immaculate Inflation. <laughs> and he points to 1933 when FDR devalued you know, the gold content of the dollar, temporarily took it off gold and then re- revalued it at a much different rate so that there'd be more dollars created. And at that point in time, unemployment was near 25%. So by any reasonable understanding of slack in the economy, 25% of unemployment would imply a huge output gap, lots of slack. Mm -hmm. And despite that, FDR's action engineered massive, temporary, but massive inflation um, in 1933. went above 20%. Now, Scott's looking at the wholesale price index, but it goes above 20%. Um, and that was due to the change in anticipated inflation. So there was a case where it was very credible, very clear, and people, you know, begin to freak out and, un- and unload their money balances, begin to spend them, turn them over because they knew prices were definitely going to be higher in the future. And this didn't have a lot of bearing on unemployment, at least, you know, immediately. I'm sure eventually it did. That's, you know, I, I missed that post. Uh, I'm afraid to say that sounds, that sounds very fascinating. And I, I think that just speaks to how, um, as e- you know, economists have to remain humble <laughs> in terms of the theories that we have to try to interpret the world. The world's very complicated. I mean, institutions vary uh, over time within a country and they're different across the country. So we have to be very careful, um, uh, in, you know, kind of resting, resting on our laurels and believing that, you know, we have a Phillips curve theory of inflation. We can rely on this uh, and not consider other other possibilities. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's fair. I, I'm sure, you know, Paul Krugman could push back against what I've just said. And in fact, I've had some people tell me personally that say, look, we believe that money matters for inflation too, David. We we believe it, but it seems to matter more when you get to higher rates of inflation or higher rates of money growth. When you get down to these low values, it's a little unclear, a little hard to tease out clean causal relationships. Maybe that's fair. It's tough either way through a money view or a Phillips curve view to, to pinpoint the exact parameters of the relationship. Um, in that's weird. Like- I've, I've heard that before. I can understand where that's coming from. Uh, you know, so nobody disputes. The mechanisms I've been describing, the monetary yep. fiscal mechanisms for understanding hyperinflations. And yet somehow we have great trouble in trying to understand the very same mechanisms for understanding low inflations. And unfortunately, our theories don't identify for us <laughs> what is a high and a low inflation. I mean, why, why should the theory break down at uh, 5% inflation and not 500% inflation? It's not entirely clear. No, I, I agree with you. I, I think um, what they would say, maybe it's harder to measure it precisely at low levels. I'm, I'm not sure. I I haven't pushed them hard back on that point. But I think the Zimbabwe, the hyperinflation, maybe Venezuela now is a great example because they're having massive runaway inflation. And I'm sure if there's a Phillips curve in the country, it has a little bearing <laughs> on what's oh, happening exactly. on with inflation. So, And that, that case is very clear where Phillips curve is very... Uh, very misleading and not useful at all. Okay. Well, I'd like to point out, I'd like to point out another, uh, fact too is that, I mean, Paul, uh, Krugman has written very well, uh, very eloquently on the case of Japan for, for many decades now. And, um, you know, in, in, in the liquidity trap there and what it would take to, uh, get out of the liquidity trap, how to raise the rate of inflation. And he appeals to the very same forces that I'm appealing to in the monetary theory uh, that I'm proposing. Um, so he was, in particular, he was not advocating for Japan to lower the unemployment rate to get their inflation rate up. He was advocating fiscal, monetary fiscal expansion through, you know, permanent helicopter drops. So <laughs> there's another example. Of, I, I don't think I don't think that he and I actually disagree fundamentally on a lot of things. It, kind of came across that way in his yeah. rebut. But. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I think that 98 paper, which I agree is too, it's, in some ways that 98 paper is just invoking long-run quantity theory of money, which is really behind yes. 
what we've been talking about today. And I, exactly. And in fact, Michael Woodford in his 2012 paper, at Jackson Hole, where he goes over all the options of the zero lower bound, he talks about like Krugman's paper, his own paper. There's some other papers that talk about the importance of permanent helicopter drops. He goes, really, this is just invoking, um, you know, the long run quantity theory. But what we recognize in these papers is it's really hard to do it credibly. It's really hard to, in advanced economy in these circumstances to do it credibly. Yes. Let me throw at you a comment from your blog. I thought it was really interesting. And you had a great reply to this. So there was a commentator and he put his name down as traditionalist. So if you're listening, traditionalist, Here's here's uh, recognizing your your comment, uh, but I, I loved your reply to this. So I'm going to read what he said, and he was responding to what Paul Krugman had said. But he basically had been echoing Paul Krugman's thoughts earlier, prior to Paul Krugman's reply. But after Paul Krugman said what he said, here's what he said. He goes, "I, I want to make a more general point, a close analog." Um, about Krugman's point, and that is that the effects of monetary policy that ignore the role of a short-term nominal interest rate. A lot of monetarist bloggers like to criticize mainstream macro's focus on monetary policy via interest rates, arguing that interest rates are really just an epiphenomenon, a distraction from the main mechanism. But if you try to identify the mechanism, the actual decision-making at the micro level, you realize that interest rates are absolutely crucial, and if anything, money is the distraction. The Fed has traditionally implemented monetary policy by intervening in an obscure market that virtually no households or firms participate in. This only influences real behavior because it affects much more important interest rates via expectations and arbitrage, and these interest rates matter for decisions. You can't escape the central role of interest rates as a summary of what matters for household decisions. Toy models can obfuscate it, but it's no accident. Rates are central to most larger-scale models." So, David, what do you say to traditionalists? Well, you know, what I, I say at, the, at a fundamental level, kind of what I what I am saying here uh, in expositing this view has to be true, because if it's not true, I think the government might have available, you know, the, one of the greatest free lunches of all time. And that's specifically if, if, if it is true that it is the unemployment rate, being below the natural rate that generates inflation and it's and that monetary factors don't play a role um and then you know there's an obvious policy conclusion here that the the fed should just basically set the nominal interest rate to zero uh the fiscal authority should cut taxes and just finance everything by issuing zero interest rate treasuries and um because this is not going to have a, an inflationary consequence, you know, this is going to be uh, obviously a, a great free lunch for everybody. So, you know, that's kind of a silly, uh, silly kind of example. But what it what it serves to show is that sooner or later, I mean, the rate at which the government expands its a supply of outside assets, I mean, it has to be inflationary uh, at some point. Right. And, and, and moreover, I'm, I don't have to invoke any immaculate inflation here. I mean, the mechanisms, I, the reason why I did not go into detail explaining the incentives is because I just thought that it was by and large, uh, very well understood. I mean, you cut taxes, you finance a tax cut, uh, with, uh, or increase government spending, whatever, and you finance it by printing money. Uh, households are going to spend that money, not expecting taxes to be raised in the future. They feel wealthier, so they're going to go out and spend money. That's going to look like a positive aggregate demand shock or, or the government increases government spending and finances it with creating new money. That's a positive aggregate demand shock. Of course, you know, you got more money chasing fewer goods. This is a very well understood and very intuitive mechanism for getting the price level to start rising. Uh, so that's basically, you know, the nature of my response to, to that type of uh, uh, observation offered by traditionalists. <laughs> it's a very clever and funny one. You know, there's that free lunch, just print and buy up everything. Well, let me throw another response out to traditionalists because he you know, focused on interest rate as a summary indicator of household decisions. And there's a part, though, where he mentions, you know, the Fed you know, does open market operations and he says this only influences real behavior because it affects much more important interest rates, plural, the expectation and arbitrage. And these interest rates matter for decisions. If you go back and look at Ellen Melter and Carl Bruner's work, where they really get into the monitor's transmission mechanism, they're very clear in pointing out that an open market operation works 
by affecting a spectrum of interest rate and asset prices, which is very much what you know, traditionalists is saying here, that you know, money affects real balances, it affects portfolios, as I mentioned earlier. The rebalancing of portfolios across all assets affects all relative asset prices and interest rates. And that you know, is really not that inconsistent with what traditionalists is saying here. I think the real tragedy is that the kind of the new Keynesian models kind of show this and kind of make it late, makes it easy for us to be lazy and think of monetary policy just in terms of one interest rate, right? The short term policy rate, or at least the expected path to the short term rate mm-hmm. relative to the neutral rate. But you know, I, I think it's fair to say the monitors, the old monitors understood that it was a broad spectrum of assets and, and households and firms through rebalancing the portfolios would affect them. So I kind of going back to your point, I, I think there's actually some agreement here. We're maybe talking past each other sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to disagree with that at all, but I, uh, in fact, I, I, I totally agree with it, but I'd also like to stress that I, I don't think that that type of thinking is necessarily inconsistent, you know, with kind of people who organize their thinking with new Keynesian models either. I mean, it's easy to, you know, the world is a complicated place. There's a lot of things going on at yeah. the same time. And it's, it's a really a question of, you know, in our little simple models, which forces we want to emphasize. And for sometimes you might want to emphasize certain forces, other times you want to emphasize others. But on the whole, I think that, you know, what I take away from all of this is, you know, I actually think the amount of disagreement in macro is, is often very much exaggerated that, you know, there's a lot we actually agree on. And it, the question is really often just a, a matter of which of these forces we think are quantitatively more important at different points in time. Yeah. You know, going back to our earlier points about the demand for money, the demand for treasuries and safe assets, it's going to be interesting to see what President Trump's you know, budget deficit blowing you know, <laughs> actions are going to do to all of this. You know, will the deficits created create a, a big enough supply of treasuries to satiate the demand? Um, you, know, we, you mentioned rates have gone up some, but they're still relatively low. Inflation Correct. still hasn't budged a whole lot. In fact, you know, what, right. this past month, it was core PCE, I think it was 1.6. Now it may take time to, to change, but it will be interesting. And, and I think you know, in, in my, from my perspective, it would be nice to get interest rates back up to normal levels like we had before. And I know there will be a lot of probably pain in the transition. People's plans and budgets and government financing costs may, may go with that. But it, it will be nice to see what happens. This is kind of a nice experiment. You know, are we truly at full employment? And, you know, what will happen if we add all this new money to the economy? It may shed some further light on this discussion we've been having today. Well, let's move to the policy implication in the time we have left. What would you say to policymakers, people at the FOMC? What's the takeaway from this conversation? Uh, the, well, the, the takeaway, I think, is to, um, you know, uh, to think about uh, a different, uh, possibly a different way of, of thinking about the inflation process. I, I really, it does, to be honest, irk me a little bit. When I see headlines in the paper saying, you know, uh, central bankers don't understand <laughs> what causes inflation. Uh, they don't understand the low inflation. Um, I, I think that uh, that's true if to the extent that you're wedded to a particular version of the Phillips curve. But I think in terms of policy uh, advice, um, you know, I'd say, you know, think more broadly that there's other other ways to think about what's driving inflation. You don't have to be so wedded to the uh, Phillips curve. You don't have to be necessarily that concerned about unemployment rate falling to 4.1 percent or even lower. That that in of itself is not necessarily something that's going to cause an inflation problem in the future. So, you know, to the extent that, um, you know, looking at a broader sp- Spectrum or viewpoints of what drives the inflation process, it, it could lead to, uh, uh, you know, more, more, a better, better monetary policy. It might lead to, uh, not raising rates too rapidly, uh, to kind of thwart, uh, an inflation that's not, not in the works. I think that, you know, that's basically what I would say. Okay. I should say that a lot of people on the FMC kind of, understand this what i'm i'm saying there's a lot of a lot of uh uh you know members who are are uh concerned about moving too fast and 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 it's just a part of an ongoing debate there's legitimate uh, uh arguments that could be made both ways so 
Yeah, Neil Kashkari, who's been on the show before, he's had some interesting things to say about this. He understands the intuition of the Phillips curve and has said so, but he's called it faith-based economics or faith-based policy making because it has been very hard to use it and it hasn't, its predictions haven't been fulfilled. And so he's, you know, kind of relying on, as you mentioned earlier, kind of data-based, you know, analysis. What does the data actually say is happening? And he's been more cautious in raising rates because of that approach. Now, one, I'd like to, could, could I push back on that a little bit? Sure. Because I think it's an important point. I mean, I, th- I agree with him that it's faith based, but I have to be, uh, you know, completely honest that almost everything we do in economics has some degree of faith based. Even my own preferred interpretation is faith based in the sense that, you know, I don't, I don't get to observe money demand directly. I can always appeal to, uh, you know, it's the, f- it's, it's the equivalent of the natural rate of unemployment. In the Phillips curve, uh, interpretation. That's a fair point. Yeah. In that, you know, there's a kind of a free parameter floating out there. And that what we have to do as economists is kind of recognize <laughs> the, where the faith is lying. And, um, and this is why I, I want to say that, you know, both interpretations and, and indeed perhaps other interpretations should be taken on board. And that the role of, of policy more generally, but monetary policy in particular, is try to search for policies that are kind of robust in the sense that they're likely to work well, regardless of what the the true underlying model is of the economy. And I think that um, you know that ultimately is is basically about the best we can do, being wise policymakers. Do you think it would help policymakers to simply, I don't say abandon, but kind of let go of Phillips curve thinking? And um, maybe you know set I mean, they've set an inflation target, but do you think moving to like a price level target or a nominal GDP level target where they focus on that would make their life any easier in this debate? That that's a very good question. I know uh, I know that uh, many people are advocating moves in that direction, and and who knows what might happen under a new uh, Fed chair uh, Jerome Powell. I'm not so sure, to be quite honest. I, I, I think um, it would take uh, a lot more thought than I've devoted to the subject to see whether or not it would make life easier. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, it, it, it may very well make life easier along some dimension. I think you're a big advocate, for example, of nominal GDP targeting, Scott Sumner, as well as others. Yes. Um, I remain agnostic. On that, I'd, I'd like to, uh, you know, for the time being, I, I haven't really given that too much thought for because for the time being, I've kind of realized that we're going to continue operating in the framework we're operating in. Uh, but it would be very interesting to, to think about that question. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just mention my thinking on that. So whether it's a price level target or nominal GDP level target, I can imagine a world, and let's just say price level target because I think that's actually getting more discussion right now. Let's say the Fed adopted a price level target. Um, you know, it, it could really just adjust its its interest rates, um, whatever tool it's using, interest rates most likely, and look at the forecast of the price level. Let me look at current values of the price level without having to worry about, um, you know, Phillips curves, natural rate of unemployment. I know they're worried about things, you know, seeping up on them or, you know, inflation suddenly surging. But I think the Fed could adopt a price level target, use asset prices, use break evens. And I think they could make their life a whole lot easier just kind of, you know, adjusting their, their instrument, looking to their target and looking at indicators, intermediate indicators that would uh, help them see where they're going. But that's my monetarist vision of the world. And I know it's not going to happen anytime soon. But our time is up. Our guest today has been David and Delfato. David, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks very much, David. I, it was a lot of fun. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.